Hi guys, my name is Kevin again with Time Knowledge Power and I'm here to show you today how to predict the stability, okay, the stability of any anion, cation, or radical that you encounter on the MCAT. And basically it's to predict the stability of compounds, okay? Um, so let's put stability. All right, cool. There are three things you're going to look through or look for in chronological order and it's the easiest to understand by looking specifically at acids. Okay, um, so when we're dealing with a charge, okay, when we're dealing with a charge or a radical, the first thing that we want to look at is what is the size of what? The compound or the atom? Exactly, it's the atom. So the first one is the size of what? The atom that the charge is on. Okay, so let's take this example down here. We have hydrofluoric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. Which one is the most um, acidic? As you know, it is hydroiodic acid. Um, and I'm going to get more into the specifics, but this completely deprotonates, this completely deprotonates, this does not completely deprotonate, although it is very toxic. And at like 50 parts per million, you can, uh, you can start to lose uh, your skin and it becomes black and stuff. So it's very dangerous. So if you're wondering why you don't use that in school, that's why. Anyways, we're going to go into why hydroiodic acid ends up being the most acidic of them all, aside from just the size. Because remember, fluorine, at least just to talk about this small concept, fluorine might be that size where um, iodine might be that size. And so you can see that a charge that's negative here, relative to this entire piece, this charge plays a much smaller role on the very large iodine, right? Sweet. Whereas fluorine would feel um, a much greater change should it have a charge because it loses its hydrogen. Okay, great. Second reason. Oh, and notice that what we're trying to do here is spread out the charge. Um, and that's going to be the key concept in understanding the stability of all these pieces. Now you can't really see the word stability up there too well. It's not a big deal. Okay, two. Why do you think I have hydrosulfuric acid on there? Well, you can imagine that it is resonance. Resonance. Okay, and if you don't remember what resonance was, ah, because you know it's very difficult because there's so many things going on with it. Um, it's about bouncing electrons from, I guess you can say one atom to another atom inside the compound. Okay, so let's deprotonate sulfuric acid. So we'll add a negative there. Okay, and when we do so, what can happen? These electrons can pop down here, and this oxygen's electrons can pop up here. So now we have, instead of a negative one charge, it's really like a negative one half and a negative one half, right? And then you can even um, share it further by doing it on this side. I guess I should make those dotted just so you can see the difference. Probably can't see that very well, <laughs> whatever. Um, and then these electrons come back up here to oxygen. And then now, again, we share that negative charge. So again, spreading that charge over more of the compound. So that is going to be the second biggest piece. And as you know, hydrosulfuric acid is actually one of the most acidic compounds um, that exist. It's got a pKa of about negative 10. Anything below zero is going to completely deprotonate. And hydroiodic acid also has a pKa of around 10, which is very cool. Um, I believe hydrosulfuric acid just slightly wins, but don't quote me on it. Anyways, um, and again, just so you can actually understand the difference between hydroiodic and hydrobromic, um, hydrobromic acid has a pK of, I think, negative 7, negative 6, something like that. So that can maybe give you some relative idea. And uh, hydrofluoric acid, interestingly enough, is, um, is 3.14. How do I know this? I see it all too often. Anyways, uh, I, there's one more thing that I was supposed to mention with the size. I said the size of the atom. And the reason I said that is because if you look at this big molecule over here, you'll probably notice that it looks a lot like a steroid um, because I kind of modeled it off of one. If this hydrogen were to disappear, so boom, gone, and we have a negative charge left, then you might say like, hey, well, size is the most important piece. Yeah, so you might uh, make an argument there, if you didn't know it was the size of the atom, that this would be more acidic than this. But that's only if 
it mattered about the size of the molecule, but it doesn't matter. It's about the size of the atom that has that charge. So if iodine has a negative versus the oxygen having a negative, this would be much, much, much more acidic. Um, and as you know, the pK of water, or in this case, it's basically an alcohol, is around 14. Um, no, no, it's around, yeah, it's around 14, but it goes up uh, if it's actually an alcohol. So I think it goes up by a factor of about one pKa per, per additional carbon, um, or per primary, secondary, tertiary carbon on this piece, but you know that's, that's irrelevant. You probably don't have to, you do not have to know that for the MCAT. Okay, then the last one, so we've got size of the atom, resonance, and the last one is electronegativity. I don't know why I put an M there, my bad. Electronegativity is the last most important piece, okay, and this is chronological order. So I want you to think back here, hydrofluoric acid. What is the pKa of fluorine? You should actually have it memorized by now. And if you don't, I will tell you, it is four. So there's uh, some actually some electronegativities that you should remember that I recommend, and I believe that it will bleed into every part of your chemistry career um, and understandings. So I know I'm digressing, but this is an extremely, extremely important point, so please do not forget it. Um, okay, so we got fluorine here, um, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, okay? And these are numbers that you will not forget. Speak with me. I will not forget it. Fluorine is the max at four, and these are electronegativities, okay? Fluorine is the max at four. Oxygen, just go uh, 0.5 below, so it's about 3.5. Nitrogen, again, about 0.5 below, so it's three, and then carbon, again. 2.5, okay, um, anything below, so we have uh, sulfur and phosphorus, sulfur is about 3, it's more like 2.9 I think, um, and then phosphorus is about like 2.6 if I recall, and those are just for reference, you don't have to commit those to memories, um, and then if we go down on this chart, so we have um, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So chlorine has actually an electronegativity of 3.1, but it's kind of weird because it's assumed that nitrogen has an electronegativity that's higher on questions. I don't know fully why that is. Um, I think it has to do with the octet rule of why it's kind of like uh, assumed that nitrogen has a stronger pull of electrons, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so chlorine has 3.2. I know you can't see it, but you know there's plenty of charts out there. You can find it. At, um, bromine is about 2.9, uh, I believe, and then iodine is 2.7. Now that's crazy because this last point, electronegativity, um, it being number three. So if we look down, hydrofluoric uh, acid, fluorine has the highest, the highest electronegativity on that chart. So you would think to yourself, oh, well it has the greatest pull of electrons, right? Well. Yes, that might be, but it's not stable when you strip it of that additional proton from the hydrogen because size matters more than electronegativity. Fluorine will pull that electron in, so will iodine. Iodine will not pull it as strongly. However, the electron is more stable on this gigantic iodine compared to it being on this small fluorine, right? There's less area that it can spread out. Okay. So this is the summary of the stability chart. Look at the size of the atom, the resonance, and the electronegativity. Um, as long as you look at those in chronological order, I guarantee that you can predict, you can predict um, the stability of any acid. Um, and then you could also use this to predict cations and what's the last one? Radicals. Um, I think, I think there are some caveats in radicals and um, cations. However, these rules are pretty much universal, especially for acids. So if you ever have a question of an acid, this is how never to forget which acid, or not really forget, but this is how to always predict which acid will be the most acidic. Look at the rule. The more stable the, um, the conjugate base is of the acid, you will know which one is more acidic. So the more stable it is, the more acidic the compound is, okay? 
So I will be doing more videos. And until then, I hope this has helped you out. Have a great day. Kevin again with Time Knowledge Power.